Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before I start my presentation, let me first express my utmost appreciation to the Ministry of External Affairs, to the Institute of Defense and St Strategic a Analysis, and for the Philippine Embassy in um, New Delhi, especially, of course, to Ambassador Teresita Daza, to make it possible for me to come to India. This is my first time to be in India, and this is something very important to me because one of my, you know, if I have to talk about my ph the philosophers, IR philosophers who have guided me, along with Posidides, Machiavelli, E.H. Carr, I would often refer to, to Cautilia. <laughs> and of course, uh, this is also the land of birth of my current preoccupation. If I'm not teaching, I'm not doing research, and not, not attending uh, conferences, or of course, tending to my family matters, uh, this is, you know, I occupy uh, probably one or two hours of my time, my recent preoccupation, and that's, of course, yoga. My presentation this, after, uh, this morning is based on my, uh, pap the paper I presented in Vietnam last November, looking at the maritime security situation, and of course, ASEAN diminishing role in maritime security, uh, security affairs, primarily because of the growing involvement of great powers. Just in the past few days, we have two developments that basically show two patterns that are happening in the region. Number one, of course, was the announcement by Taiwan that China has deployed surface-to-air missiles in Woody Island. Of course, this is part of the pattern of China's maritime expansion that, of course, has begun as early as 2008. The goal, of course, is this is indicated by China's increasing defense budget, greater assertiveness in the South China Sea, and of course, with the end goal of not simply having 80% control of the South China Sea, having control of the first island chain as far as the East China Sea. Ma'am, talk here about you know, the, the fact that we probably in the 21st century, we won't see the spear of influence or the great game. It's happening again. And it's happening in, the first, uh, in, in East Asia with China's maritime expansion. It's not a simple of territorial dispute. It's China's b basic goal, of course, is to push the United States out of the first island chain to op uh, wherein, of course, the People's Liberation Army's Navy could operate as far as the Far Seas, as far as, you know, Guam. And, of course, this is uh, captured by President Xi Jinping's proposal to President Barack Obama in 2013 uh, of a new great power relationship, wherein, of course, the United States would have to respect China's core interests in this part of the world. The Pacific is big enough for the two powers. We're going back into classic 19th century sphere of influence. And this is, of course, shown by Chinese action and, of course, China's disregard with international law. Of course, China is a member of the UNCLOS, but it doesn't observe the UNCLOS. Everyone here is aware of the fact that we filed a case against China and, of course, with China's position to ignore the Philippine filing of a case in the International Arbitrage Tribunal. Now, let's look at the, what's happening in the other side of the Pacific. Of course, you have President Barack Obama telling the ASEAN countries to stand up against China. Again, we see, of course, the pattern of U.S. reaction, and to a certain degree, U.S. assertion of the fact that it's a Pacific power in the region. Of course, the United States is not an angel. Of course, they have done, got involved in the Vietnam War, had a very uh, problematic relation with uh, India during the time of the Cold War, and of course, in our case, the United States is our ally, but it was not a harmonious relation. You know, in, 19, uh, in 1992, we asked the Americans to evacuate, to remove their facilities in the Philippines. Uh, but, of course, uh, in the pursuit of its goal as a, a Pacific power, the United States has basically been able to effect two, uh, two effects. Number one, of course, maintaining a regional balance of power, where we won't have a predominant hegemon that will kick the small powers and basically treat the small powers as they are dirt. This basically provided the ASEAN the diplomatic space for small powers to band together and, of course, pursue their goals and basically take charge of the driver's seat when we talk about regional security. And, this, and of course, second uh, result of the U.S. Uh, projection as the Pacific power is mainta maintaining the regional commons, the uh, seas that would be used by all countries without a single country claiming sovereignty over certain portions of, the, uh, of, the, of East Asia. So what's basically happening right now? You have, of course, great in, uh, greater involvement of big powers, along, of course, with Japan, and you have the small powers, the ASEAN member states, being put in a tight position. So, uh, of 
course, ASEAN, as a regional organization, has responded as early as in the 1990s when Indonesia conducted a series of workshops. And of course, in 2003, ASEAN and China signed the ASEAN Declaration of uh, Code of Conduct on the South China Sea. Uh, ASEAN approach is basically, of course, to incorporate China and other great powers into what we call the ASEAN system. So my presentation will be looking at how ASEAN is managing the South China Sea dispute, and of course, current developments that in the way are undermining ASEAN's role as, of course, the driver's seat when we talked about regional security issue, that might possibly lead, and this is, of course, my fear, the balkanization of Southeast Asia. So, uh, of course, when we talk about ASEAN security role, we have the ASEAN Regional Forum, which was formed in 1995. The goal, of course, is basically a upshot of ASEAN approach when they have to resolve disputes, like, of course, the dispute between the Philippines and Mal uh, Malaysia in 1967, how basically ASEAN dealt with Vietnam during the Cold War, after the Vietnamese invasion, of course, of Cambodia. And that's, of course, to incorporate them to a system of annual consultation, what we call the ASEAN means, which would involve managing disputes but not resolving them. The other, of course, component of the ASEAN approach is what I would call equibalancing. Try to bring in all the big powers together with the hope that they will balance each other. I think this is the goal of ASEAN in opening up relations, of course, closer relations with India. India is perceived as one of the great powers who have, of course, a responsibility in ensuring that ASEAN could play that role of equibalancing the great powers in the region. But of course, the ASEAN way has its limits. It has been designed among small powers that basically have no interest in having conflicts among them. And of course, provided them a, short, a sort of a shield that will enable them to deal from a position of strength when they have to deal with big powers. But of course, it has its limitations. Mm -hmm. And China's actions recently have shown that limitations. What's it be basically been Chinese, China has been doing? Of course, when the ASEAN Regional Forum was formed in 1995, the goal then was to incorporate China into the system, to basically teach China the ways and means of how smaller, small powers are able to manage their dispute. In a way, this is a very naive perception. China is a great power. It would act and think as a great power. So what basically have China has done? It has joined the ASEAN Regional Forum, but in the process has also undermined it. Uh, what are basically the indications? Number one, the fact that the declaration of conduct had gotten nowhere. ASEAN and China has been negotiating for a binding code of conduct last 13 years. China basically said, we have first to implement a non-binding declaration code of conduct before we can negotiate about a code of conduct. And then, of course, you have uh, what is called the salami strategy, dividing the ASEAN into small parts and its process making the region weak. Of course, this became uh, apparent, and of course, the Philippines was com uh, complicit in it, with the joint maritime seismic undertaking that was undertaken in the early 21st century, which effectively, of course, divided ASEAN. And of course, we have seen the division within ASEAN, as shown as what happened in Phnom Penh in 2012, when for the first time, ASEAN failed to come out with a communique. Then recently, of course, in the ASEAN Defense Minister's Forum, when again, the uh, forum was not able to come out with a communique, and of course, it's because of China's objection. So what's basically happening is the fact that slowly ASEAN is you know, uh, being uh, paralyzed in dealing with the, uh, with the South China Sea dispute, which basically paid ground for the involvement of other great powers. The strategic rebalancing of the Obama administration is indication of the fact that the United States is recognized as ASEAN is not capable of constraining an emergent China bent, of course, on maritime control of the South and East China Sea. And of course, you have the, uh, Japan entering the picture, creating what I would call a strategic balance which in a way provides stability, but it's also very dangerous. It provides basically a very fluid situation where the dispute is not resolved, creating possibilities that minor incidents could trigger what Mao Zedong called a single spark could start a fairy fire. So let me just go into my conclusion. What's basically happening right now, of course, is China's effort to uh, effect maritime control, not only with the South China Sea, but of course as far as the East China Sea with a goal, of course, uh, pushing the United States out of region, basically undermining America's role since the beginning of the 20th century as an offshore strategic balancer. 
And of course, China's, in a way, China's efforts to weaken ASEAN as a regional organization that could deal and possibly constrain uh, ASEAN, which of course, again, uh, leads to greater involvement of the United States and Japan into the South China Sea dispute. So what's basically happening right now is you have a great power game, again, the notion of uh, 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 the great game that happened here in South Asia in the 19th century between Britain, of course, and Russia. It's happening in East Asia. And of course, the tragedy here is uh, there are already signs that you see the cracks within ASEAN, that ASEAN, uh, hopefully, I'm not saying that it, I hope it will not, that you might have, of course, division happening within the ranks of ASEAN, which of course might lead, hopefully not in the fu future, the balkanization of Southeast Asia. Thank you very much for your attention.